Sunday school. I'm very active in the church and, and their social activities and you know, had gone to church on Sunday and the day before she was missing. As their search began, police were also able to eliminate one... If you get the message, give me a call because I just want to know if when you guys were getting home, you've already eaten, they haven't eaten, if you want me to make something, anyway, give me a call, okay. Hi, Mom. What do you want for dinner? What would you like me to fix? And, and that's just the kind of girl she was. It was the day after that phone call that Brooke Wilberger disappeared. The first week was, um, we were just getting inundated with leads, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, we didn't have anything else to go on, so we needed the leads. We had the hope that Brooke would come back alive. We had, we had the hope that um, some lead would turn into something substantial. The family knew that to find Brooke, police would have to find whoever took her. It looked like they might have when a man named Sung Koo Kim was arrested in Corvallis just a week after Brooke vanished. Kim faces charges for breaking into college girls' dorm rooms and also stealing their underwear. I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to talk about it. We had people who on the team thought that, yeah, Mr. Kim was the person. And we had people on the team who thought, no, we don't believe he is. Thank you very much, Tony. It turned out Sung Koo Kim was not involved. He was just a fleeting person of interest. Police say there have been 50 of them, none the person who took Brooke Wilberger from her family. So we just tried not to think of any anger, tried not to deal with that. Our whole objective has been to find Brooke. As leads went nowhere and the months went by, press attention fit, and the family was left alone with their dwindling expectations and their worst fears. My oldest daughter, five-year-old at the time, I think we were making cookies or something like that, and she said, you know, Mom, I think that someone probably killed Ambrook. And I said, you know what, I actually think that too. Because at some point, you know, reality sets in. In that period when hope for any resolution fades, no one could have known that the major break in the case was just over the horizon. In New England, the family of missing University of Massachusetts co-ed Maura Murray is running through the same gauntlet of emotions. Maura's parents are divorced and her mother Lori is battling throat cancer. Maura's father Fred is battling the system. And it's pretty much all I can think of. And and I wake up thinking about it. And uh, I, I, I'm thinking about it when I go to bed. Still, years after Maura vanished, Fred Murray often travels from Massachusetts to roam the New Hampshire area where his daughter was last seen. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you very much. I had to stop to say hi. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. I definitely get a lot of that. Everybody is sympathetic, and they would help if they could. My daughter, named Maura Murray, she... Fred Murray has become his own detective, doing an amateur version of the investigation he says police never did. No police went up and down the street asking people. Uh, these these neighbors weren't uh, uh, asked about what they saw that night for about 10 days, and that was only after uh, the family started uh, you know, screaming about it. There are literally thousands and thousands of hours um, that have been dedicated towards coming up with, you know, what happened to Mara Murray. Authorities have done several searches, including a major effort five months after Mora vanished. They say it's still an active missing persons case, and therefore standard policy prohibits their sharing of documents or findings with Mora's father. This, this, this bugs the hell out of me. Uh, I don't agree with some of his observations um, but I understand certainly his frustration in, in not knowing what happened to his daughter. It was frustration heightened by some police theories that Morris family could not believe. It's clear to us it was her intention to at least get away for a certain period of time. Several times a year. Uh, Argus tells us Mara's father Fred can't help but think that more could have been done to find her that night. 
and he's haunted by what might have happened to his daughter, a girl with infinite promise. Here again is Elizabeth Vargas. The United States Military Academy at West Point is known to accept only the best and the brightest. That's how family and friends would describe small-town Massachusetts-raised Maura Murray. Never anything but an A all the way from the first grade straight through high school. I was proud. You don't get in there just because of one thing. There's, you have to do almost everything right, you know? You gotta be a lucky to get in there too. Friends say Maura's luck continued when she met older cadet Bill Rausch. She couldn't stop talking about him and he had given her a stuffed animal for Christmas which she like wouldn't put down and just her face would light up every time someone mentioned his name. I'd say I, I probably was more the lucky one. She's so easy to really just love and, and to care about. She's so sweet, sincere and uh, adorable. Very spontaneous, uh, adventurous, definitely just gorgeous. He said, Mom, I've met the most phenomenal girl. I can't wait for you and Dad to come up and for you to meet her. And we fell instantly in love with her. Maura decided she wanted to study nursing and left West Point for the University of Massachusetts. Say hi. <laughs> Bill graduated West Point, was stationed in Oklahoma, but distance only seemed to deepen their commitment. She was planning on going out to Oklahoma for the summer of 04 and part of her nursing program and she was going to get a job at a hospital in Lawton, Oklahoma and do part of her internship there. We both knew where we wanted to go in the relationship. Actually, marriage had been in the air for quite some time. What Bill Rausch describes as the solid ground of their relationship was shaken one February night. He got some news he immediately passed on to his parents. I answered the phone and I heard panic in his voice and he told us just very quickly, you know, uh, I just got a phone call uh, from Mara's family and her car has been found abandoned in New Hampshire. I was just really panicked. For reasons she apparently shared with no one, on February 9th in 2004, Maura Murray left her dorm in Massachusetts and drove some 130 miles into New Hampshire. The car she was driving was found in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. At some point, she reached Route 112 in Haverhill. Joe McGee reported the story for the Patriot Ledger in Quincy, Massachusetts. At a hairpin turn, she went off the road, her car hit a tree. The accident was serious enough to put the car out of commission, but one from which Mora could walk away. It was probably the last place that anyone would want to be lost. It's cold, it's desolate, it's barren, and it's very dark. At that point, a person came along, he was driving a bus, he was a neighbor. He had been taking tourists to skiing in the area that day. He asked her if she needed help, she refused. She told him that she had called AAA, uh, that she was all set, and she had a record coming. But in that area of New Hampshire, cell phones don't work, so she had not made that call. In the dark of night, it's conceivable that Mora was afraid to accept a ride from a strange man in an empty bus. The last person, as it turns out, known to have seen her. Now, police have said they've questioned him continually, and they don't consider him a suspect. The bus driver and neighbors across the street from the scene both called 911 to report a young woman stranded on Route 112. About 10 minutes later, police showed up to the scene, and Mora Murray was gone. News of that night's events reached Morris' father when police called at 4 p.m. the next day. My immediate reaction when I found out that my daughter was missing was right at the edge of panic. She's, you found her car, she was in an accident. She's not there. Where is she? 